<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with me. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, so, <clears throat> the biggest thing in the news right now is the Dune movie. How many people have seen the Dune movie? The new one. There have been a few. Um, <clears throat> We saw it on IMAX, so it was pretty you know, impressive. The sound system was pretty impressive. <clears throat> Sparked uh, a hot series of controversies and dialogues and discussions among many people because uh, being the most number one popular science fiction story of all time, winning every award that could ever been won by a science fiction story, someone who takes on Dune, <laughs> you know, and isn't faithful to the original story is going to create all kinds of controversy. Now, I could devote an entire <clears throat> episode to Dune. <clears throat> Being an old fan from way back, here's my, this is not even my original copy. I mean, this poor, this poor guy is like, completely beat up and I mean it's actually like coming in pieces <laughs> um, <clears throat> but this is the original printing my original copy I bought in <clears throat> 1966 right after I graduated from high school I was going to art school <clears throat> and in 1977 I had a house fire and everything burned up including that and one of the first things that I bought was the I Ching was number one. This was number two. And Tolkien's Trilogy was number three. My favorite books of all time were Tolkien and Tolkien's Trilogy, which was the big deal. Dune and Tolkien's Trilogy in the 60s were The Secret Underground, <clears throat> along with a bunch of other little books like Send Flesh, Send Bones, all the books by Herman Hess, the Carlos Castaneda series, um, things like that. Eventually, I did buy myself a hard brown bound copy with gold trim of Dune. <clears throat> As a diehard fan of the Tolkien's trilogy, <clears throat> I eventually bought... <clears throat> The Ultimate Collector's Edition, um, this thing, filled with pictures, and filled with pictures that I myself even had collected throughout. So I have a pretty fully illustrated <clears throat> book here, Hulk's Trilogy. <clears throat> So, um, that said, <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, I'm afraid we're going to uh, be uh, going down the rabbit hole again today. Um, <clears throat> I apologize to anyone who is getting bruises from their seatbelts <laughs> as we go on these crazy rides. Um, this is no exception. Um, the latest news feeds all have to do with um, quantum gravity and the reconcile of the two great forces of the universe, the macro universe that we live in, according to Newton's laws, <clears throat> and the micro world of the quantum field where the rules just seem to be odd and weird. <clears throat> it all seems to be very standard on one side of the wall, the periodic table, uh, made of atoms, smallest material particles of physical matter that still retain all their properties. That's the definition of an atom. Smallest particle you can identify of gold is a gold atom. Below that is quantum particles that make up atoms. 
protons, electrons, neutrons in configurations. <clears throat> the configurations are mathematical. And the rules that govern that math are music theory. <laughs> All very cool, eh? Um, and mus music theory has to do with sound. So the periodic table is a wash with the two grand forces that I've talked about many times of uh, electromagnetism and sound form the universe. And it's my feeling, of course, that in the beginning was sound. <clears throat> Light came after. And of course, you know, every um, religious text in the world has a similar story. In the beginning was sound uh, which uh, and electromagnetism came after that. We've discussed that a few times with uh, examples like um, sonoluminescence, um, where you have a sphere filled with some kind of water <clears throat> with two speakers facing each other, and the speakers are putting sound into the water and it's creating a pressure wave that compacts the water molecules in the center uh, and creates a bubble which collapses called cavitation and when it collapses the force of that collapse is strong enough to create a star in a jar the brightness level is brighter than our sun and the heat temperature in the center of that little light that shows up from sound. Sound forms light. Sound waves forming electromagnetism, I believe, is a miniature of, quote, the Big Bang, the creation of everything, where we all have our own personal little Big Bang, you know, uh, in the womb. <clears throat> At 16 to 24 weeks, when the five senses first come online, the only ones that are active that can receive anything is hearing, and vibration sense. So for each one of us, the very first thing we experienced in our own sort of, you know, fetal uh, religious text was in the beginning was the word, the sound. First thing we ever experienced was the sound. Later in the third trimester, when the belly is stretched enough, uh, thin enough, the light can filter through and I get my you know, then there was light later. Um, but as we um, shall see, <laughs> I don't know how many people we lost today, but <clears throat> today is daylight savings time. It's an hour later than you think, so I'm sure we may have lost a few people who still think it's 1130. <laughs> <clears throat> but we all know that, you know, time is an illusion, right? It couldn't be anything more stark as a reminder um, that the gray and grand forces of time marching forward is a subjective experience. When you're having fun, it goes by quickly. When you're bored, it's going slowly. You know, even Albert Einstein got into the game Time it is an illusion. <clears throat> American Indians had a good take on it. When told the reason for daylight savings time, the old Indians said only the government would believe that you could cut a foot off the top of a blanket, sew it to the bottom, and have a longer blanket. But be that as it may, <clears throat> the idiosyncrasies of time in the 21st century has led us to this place where somehow an hour has been added or lost or something. Something's happened to it. And we stand on the dizzying <laughs> precipice once again of realizing that the eternal present is all that truly exists and our perception of time is an illusion.
not real. <laughs> it's not something that's actually happening. I mean, we're always trying to look behind the veil to to see what might be going on. And of course, when we do that, we see a, a sort of a swirling mass of quantum field uh, mathematics and uh, ancient texts from the Upanishads all mixed up together. Certainly talked about that enough. <laughs> I keep sort of going back to that theme. Um, when we talked about, <clears throat> I think it was uh, three weeks ago, we <clears throat> had the broadcast on quantum gravity. And so, you know, that's the, one of the big conundrums in for a physicist that has been going on and on and on since the advent of Einstein's theory of relativity, general relativity, <clears throat> which was his description of the uh, sort of the macro universe with the three forces and gravity. So these four forces are recognized in classical physics to describe everything in the universe. <clears throat> Gravity could never be reconciled with the other three forces. One force is the electromag electromagnetism. So that's the electromagnetic spectrum of all electromagnetic frequencies and photons and the speed of light and E equals MC squared. And then in the realm of the atom, there seems to be other forces going on. Um, the atoms are too small to really be affected by gross gravity that affects, you know, planetary orbits and me sitting on this chair falling towards the center of the earth and <clears throat> things like that. Inside the atom is the strong force and the weak force you know, the forces that bind and hold the atom together so it doesn't explode out. Um, Gurdjieff had called this the law of falling, that there's a force in the universe where everything tends to want to fall towards something, towards somewhere. Um, <clears throat> you get enough mass assembled together in a ball floating in space, then that mass begins to attract more mass to it, which clumps together, which makes the ball larger and larger, and pretty soon you've got a planet, or you've got a star. The mass gets so big and so big and so big that the pressures at the center ignite you know, nuclear fusion, and now we've got a fire burning in space. Um, if that star gets large enough and large enough and large enough. <clears throat> and sooner or later, the nuclear fusion, the star gets old in nuclear fusion, furnaces begin to cool down, and the force of gravity overcomes the explosive force outward from the, the nuclear fires in the center. Then that star collapses, and if the star is large enough, it collapses into a black hole. It collapses forever. Uh, there are certain thoughts that a black hole is a doorway into parallel universes and, or other dimensions. Um, one of my other favorite uh, sci-fi authors, Arthur C. Clarke, wrote a book, a sci-fi book, where he took on that scientific principle from his standpoint, uh, black holes spread throughout our universe um, are bleeding the laws of our universe through the black hole and spewing them out in a parallel universe to ours. <clears throat> and that parallel universe is piercing into our universe 
with what he called white holes. A white hole, from our standpoint, would be an explosion coming through the black hole in their side, exploding through to our side, which would look like what? A star, a sun. So both universes bleed into each other. There's one way of looking at it. Um, and it may be that some black holes are that and other ones are something else, that there's a variety of black holes and all kinds of different rules, a variety, a whole smorgasbord of different types of black holes that accomplish different things in the universe. Um, when we go back and look behind the veil, <clears throat> at least what scientists are trying to do, to solve the big problem of how do we reconcile um, not only gravity with the other three forces on this side of the wall, periodic table, but how do we reconcile the two grand uh, laws that seem to govern everything where it's Newton, you know, Isaac Newton on one side of the wall and it's uh, something weird on the other side of the wall, the quantum side, where the two of those obviously work together. <clears throat> and in trying to reconcile those two worlds, which is the biggest problem of physics, it's been going on for forever since Einstein t tackled it. And so far, there's a, f a few different ideas of what the solution could be. And the best solution of all of those uh, so far, this seems to be quantum pixelization, which is what we're talking about today. <clears throat> Quite a mouthful. <clears throat> and essentially, uh, you know, actually brought to you by our sponsor, um, Quantum Pixel, it's a nonprofit organization. <laughs> Uh, that is infinitely large and has been here forever. Um, uh, but underlying everything, every place we look, the yin-yang thing continually shows up over and over and over again. Light and dark, man and woman, in and out, uh, up and down, <clears throat> good and bad, quantum and Newton, um, always appears to be going on here. The reconciling of those two forces and figuring out uh, the one missing piece that's so far gravity. How does gravity work in a quantum field? How does the whole thing fit together? It's the odd man out. And nobody seems to be able to figure out how to reconcile it. Um, <clears throat> when we start looking at the articles, uh, scientific articles that are spinning around. Uh, I mean, this or, <laughs> orbital angular momentum mode, division filtering for photon phonon coupling. So never mind all these other fancy words here. I'm centering on photon phonon coupling. Uh, phonon photon coupling is Again, the two grand forces of electromagnetism with photons and sound, which is phonons. Phonons and photons create the universe. Sort of the, unhung, the unsung hero is sound. People don't seem to recognize that that's one of the two primal forces that make everything. Um, until you dig deep enough into quantum physics where you realize that they're talking about this all the time, that a photon is the smallest particle of electromagnetism, smallest particle of light, photon, and a phonon is the smallest, quote, particle of a sound, that sound waves are actually particles of phonons with a wave light function. 
the smallest particle of sound that can be identified uh, as a force. Remember, uh, photons and the electro and, and electromagnetism uh, carries charge. It's what Kajiv called the law of three: positive, negative, and neutral. And phonons carry force, pure energy moving through a medium at a certain frequency according to the law of seven, an octave. <clears throat> Three and seven equals ten, and that's you and me. Ten fingers, ten toes. Um, there's a reason for it. It's all fractal refra reflected together in every way you can think of. Um, unveiling the quantum dance. Experiments reveal a nexus of vibrational and electronic dynamics. The coupling of electronic and nuclear dynamics reveals in molecules with ultrafast lasers and x-rays. So experiments unveil long theorized quantum phenomenon. And what is that quantum phenomenon? It's the marriage of photons and phonons forming everything that happens in the largest scales that you can imagine where we have something that they call gravity waves, which are really sound ripples in space-time, you know, where, where the crest of each ripple is, you know, tens of millions of light years from crest to crest in a time scale that we can't even see as something that is moving. It appears to be frozen to us, but in universal time scales, it's a pebble dropping in a in a pond and creating a ripple pattern coming out, except it's a three-dimensional pond, and the ripples are spheres. And they're not just spheres. They're four-dimensional and five-dimensional and ten-dimensional ripples. Um, <clears throat> electron, phonon, and electron-photon interactions. Um, and this thing called resonant Raman scattering from the radial breathing mode of single wall carbon nanotubes. So I know this is a mouthful. Um, Raman scattering is when <clears throat> the electron phonon phenomenon causes the electron photons, the, you know, the particles from the electromagnetic half, uh, scatter when they hit things they scatter and bounce off and stuff like that and phonons do the same thing except in a different mode and that brings together the famous double s s uh, slit experiment which led to um hi uh, uh, the uh, heisenberg uncertainty principle and Schrodinger's cat paradox, which came from that. So the idea that you've got two slits and you're shining a light through there, and the photons of the light are like little particles, you know, little BBs shooting out. And <clears throat> so when you're watching this experiment, they go, the BBs go through the two slits, go straight through and hit the screen on the back and, and form two bright columns as you would expect. But if you look away and you don't observe the experiment, all of those little particles collapse into a wave, a, a sound wave instead of a light wave. So it becomes a wave form of light that is now if, if, if it was water hitting those two slits, the water would come through and create um, ripple patterns that are crossing over each other and creating summations and cancellations and form a series of lines on the wall. Look at the wall, two lines. Look away from the wall, many lines. It's the duality of the particle wave duality of reality and sometimes it appears to function like uh, photons and sometimes it appears to be functioning like phonons. Um, <clears throat> however, they're bringing up this idea of 
single wall carbon nanotubes that these carbon nanotubes are a direct um, relationship to a, a, this phonon and photon interactions that cause this kind of scattering uh, is seen most clearly and most precisely in single walled carbon nanotubes. Now, why am I bringing that up? Because in the past, I did a whole thing about uh, the nanotube structures in the body, that, that the grand forces of the universe of photons and phonon interactions of sound and light coming together in the big yin-yang. The interface of this big yin-yang is creating things. And one of the things it creates out of that is this sedimentation of carbon nanotubes. And where we see these carbon nanotubes is mostly in biology. Biological forms seem to arise from the universal interaction between sound and light. <clears throat> Cellular membranes serve as an ideal example of a system that is multifunctional, tunable, precise, and efficient. These carbon nanotubes spread throughout the cell membrane and inside the cell uh, to uh, attach to all of the little tiny organelles inside the cell. So when I went to school and we learned cellular biology, so we've got this thin membrane on the outside <clears throat> that contains the water inside the cell. It's got uh, a, a nucleus, uh, so this thin membrane on the outside, and we've got this nucleus, and we've got all these little organelles inside of here, the endoplasmic reticulum, and uh, the mitochondria, and ribosomes, and all, you know, all of that kind of stuff is in there. But when I went to school, we learned that they're just sort of floating around. Now we realize that they're all uh, attached to a skeletal structure of uh, microtubules. So there's a skeletal structure of microtubules inside the cell that attach all these little organelles to each other, to the nucleus, and to the inside of the cell membrane. So these things aren't moving, they're stable. Uh, <clears throat> and then on the outside here, there is a scaffolding of microtubules that attach to the outside of the cell wall and go out and attach to other cells. So all the cells themselves are not just floating around, they're all attached to each other with microtubules as well, these sort of microtubular structures, right? Um, and it's everywhere, including in your brain cells and how your brain is put together. The neuron's brain, the remarkable scaffolding microtubes, the cell's engineering language, the neuron circuit board. Um, uh, while maintaining its shape, it performs specialized functions such as growing long axons to send signals to other cells and growing thousands of dendrites to receive information from other cells. <clears throat> the interesting thing about the structure of these nanotubes, um, microfibers, is that they have a piezoelectric effect that they're basically crystalline structure and crystalline structures in physics are the only ones that generate something called the piezoelectric effect. So um, the, it turns out that the engineering of this body is based on the principle of piezoelectric generation of electrical pulses from pressure. Um, so all the cells in your body are networked together with these microtubules. The microtubules are a certain type of crystal lattice structure that lends itself to generate electrical pulses 
when it's under torque and pressure. Uh, so uh, when we, so I mean, these like microtubules are in the axons of your nerves. It's it's in the neurons of your brain. It's networked throughout your whole body and every structure you've got. Um, and it's not just your body, it's every kind of physical structure that we know in the universe. There's microtubules and all kinds of organic life, plants and bacteria and little creatures that swim around in the water and <clears throat> all kinds of different microtubules populate those systems. And the piezoelectric effect um, is when you put pressure or torque on these microtubules, it lines up all the charges so that it generates an electrical pulse. Uh, it, <clears throat> there was an article two years ago that I did a whole broadcast on microtubules and this whole phenomenon uh, because an article came through my newsfeed that appeared to indicate that the newest research was showing that when electrical pulses fired down the axons, so in your brain, we've got the neurons. The neurons fire an electrical charge. The electrical charge travels down an axon and hits another cell. Right? Um, it's a bit more complicated than that. There's way stations where you have a synapse and the signal comes down and either excites or does not excite neurotransmitters to go to the other half and then it continues on. Decisions are being made whether whether this neuron firing is actually going to communicate to another one or not. Um, however, without that, the electrical signal passing down are, you know, the electromagnetic force. In reality, though, what this was showing is that it doesn't explain all the phenomenon that we see of how propagation of electricity goes down these axons, unless you take into account the piezoelectric effect. So in reality, what's happening is that the initiation of the, um, uh, of the pulse that comes from the neuron is a sound pulse. It's, uh, it's a pure energy moving down the axon, initiated from something that happens in the neuron. The neuron builds up pressure, sound pressure, and that pressure puts torque on the microtubular structure that makes up the whole axon and the whole neuron structure. You're putting pressure on it, and pressure causes an excitation of the piezoelectric effect where the microtubules generate electrical pulses. And now you can envision going down the axon is a pressure wave of sound, a ripple that's moving down that um, axon. And that pressure wave, is, as it moves along, is torquing and putting compression on the microtubules that make up the axon and flipping them over into a liquid crystal state where it generates an electrical pulse, a piezoelectric effect pulse. And so the electricity traveling down these axons is actually a piezoelectric depolarization of the microtubules under pressure from a sound wave that's moving down. The, so the whole system works on sound and the electromagnetic stuff that we're measuring with EEG is an after effect, a piezoelectric after effect of pressure waves moving down the axons. How crazy is that idea? Um, but once again, we're back to the grand yin-yang forces of the universe. Sound and light, electromagnetism, photons and phonons interacting together in some kind of grand uh, orchestrated plan that plays itself out most perfectly in organic systems like you and me. 
that we are the interface where these two meet, where these two grand forces meet, a phenomenon takes place which is best expressed by organic life. That we are the result of this interaction between the two grand forces of electromagnetism and phonons and sound. <clears throat> Unified concept of nothingness and interdisciplinary exploration of quantum physics and Vedic philosophy. So, you know, we talked about nothingness before. Terence Witt, um, that the only mathematical value that explains infinity and forever is nothing. Because nothing doesn't, you know, isn't there, it never had a beginning, it will never have an end. So by definition, it's eternal, forever. And we have infinitely simple zero and infinitely complex zero with an equal sign. And infinitely complex zero over here is every mathematical possibility of zero to itself that equals zero. So this complex set over here is all math. And every kind of math you could ever imagine, all the highest math you've ever heard of, simple math like plus and minus and multiplication and square roots of zero equals zero, you know, zero plus zero equals zero, zero times zero equals zero, on and on and on like that. So this becomes unimaginably infinitely complex mathematical relationship of zero to itself. And the relationship itself is something that pops out of nothing. And that's this. This is nothing more than relationships of nothing to itself made manifest as the something of that relationship of things. The relationship of math to itself, of nothing to itself mathematically, is this. And when we look at this, it's all mathematical. Math, mathematics explains it all. Um, so th that concept, uh, once again, mainline straight back of between quantum physics and Vedic philosophy, as I've said many times before. Quantum physics looks like ancient texts 4,000 years ago. We're right back in the saddle of these guys, of this infinite field of ancient wisdom that has discussed these issues at great length and talked about the grand forces that come together talked about the yin-yang, the grand yin-yang of things, talked about the fact that it's all a dream and it's all based on nothing except a, a sort of a dream in the mind of God. Um, it all, all the forces come together in one place at some point, over and over and over again. You find out that these people from the past uh, were a lot smarter than we gave them credit for. Um, and so the interface between this and modern quantum physicists who play around in these very expensive labs trying to solve the basic problems of what makes the universe tick, it's the same stuff, the same impetus inside the minds and hearts of these people and these people. They're explorers to find out what's so, what makes it all work? Why am I here? Why is all of this here? Where did it come from? Where is it going? Uh, and that was the fascination when Gurdjieff came over in the 20s with all these fantastic mathematical formulas and diagrams and esoteric information that had been hidden away for thousands of years in special secret brotherhoods and um, these crazy mathematical charts that showed how the law of three and the law of seven mixed together, the law of electromagnetism and the law of sound as the foundation for everything that, that you could sort of plug into that formula. Uh, his concept of the ray of creation, where the law of octaves and the law of harmonics set forth the formation of different levels of how the universe filters down into you and me. Um, all part of the larger thing that we see going on all the time around us, you know, 
uh, a new science of consciousness, uh, a new science of uh, spirit and space-time and what does it all mean? How does it all work out? It's a constant force that's going on all around us all the time. It's deep thought about the meaning aligned with science uh, to find out um, how does this all work? What's my place in it? And all the indicators are that my place in it is central. Like I said before, um, Terence Witt in his formulas talked about if you have an infinite universe that never had a beginning, that it's been here forever and it's going to be here forever. And that means that uh, infinitely large versus infinitely small, and there's no place where that ends. I mean, uh, modern physicists talk about the smallest of the small as the Planck length. You can't get any s smaller than that. Uh, or you can't get any larger than the largest structures that we've been able to measure so far or imagine. Um, someplace inside of you, you instinctively know that that can't be so. If you have infinity, infinite universe, it goes forever smaller and forever larger. Uh, that um, there's no constraints that go on there. It's just the limits of, of how far your mind can stretch or your instruments can measure. Nobody's ever been able, you know, to take a picture or measure the Planck length. It's a concept on a blackboard. Um, you know, so um, this uh, concept of where's my place in it and the newest information of the quantum field showing that um, there is no objective universe at all unless somebody's witnessing it. And therefore, consciousness is an absolute central requirement for reality itself to exist as we experience it. That all of the things that you see around me have no reality except as part of my experiencing them uh, in an interface where my expectation collapses a probability field into particles that form things like lamps and computers and pianos and all the rest of that. It's a construction of consciousness, not the other way around, not an objective universe where perhaps consciousness is a byproduct of electrical activity and neurons in my brain. <laughs> this flips that on its head, that neurons and brains are a manifestation of an expectation of consciousness, a choice of consciousness from a smorgasbord menu of all kinds of different possibilities that the field could collapse into. And so it's collapsing into this form of a field because we've decided that this is the way reality looks. Uh, there, and like I say, there's power in numbers that when many of us start to agree that this is the way reality looks, then it becomes more and more and more solid. Um, however, great changes are just a snap of a finger away. If enough of us agree that reality no longer looks this way, it looks like something else. Uh, something that works better for all of us than the current form that we're seeing, which is what these live streams are sort of all about. Um, some of the greatest minds in history have thought these th same thoughts, have dwelled deeply on trying to discover the secrets of it all. In a grand, like, you know, he's, Einstein spent his whole life trying to find the grand uniform theory of all things, the simple rule that everything spins from, and he was unsuccessful. He couldn't reconcile the four grand forces that he was able to identify because gravity just didn't seem to fit the rest of it somehow. But these attempts of, of erecting mental scaffoldings and mathematics to try to explain it all has always come up short throughout history. 
and it's the same in the present day. Um, we're looking for mathematical patterns in the chaos. You know, if you, it's like laying on your back on a summer day and seeing castles in clouds. Your subconscious mind is constantly active, trying to make sense of chaotic patterns. So if I stare at clouds long enough, I'm going to see faces and people and horses and stuff. Um, I remember in, uh, back in the old days, the, the two things that kept me sane when I was going to chiropractic school uh, in the 70s in Davenport, Iowa, uh, was um, Saturday Night Live and Doctor Who. <laughs> Stuck in my little apartment in the middle of the Midwest, uh, you know, uh, racking my brain to learn all this stuff was it was the toughest experience I've ever had to go through. It was uh, squeezing through the eye of that needle and coming out the other side as a doctor. And squeezing through the, the eye of that needle of learning the nth degree about physics and uh, physiology and uh, that this body is the textbook of universal law, but I'm learning a medical level of detail about what's here. And it's blowing my mind because now I'm seeing new levels of information about how the cosmos works through this micro textbook of universal law. Uh, so we're always sort of uh, looking for uh, patterns in the, in the chaos. Um, it's what we do best. Um, so if we have an infinite field of all possibilities, that is chaos then someplace in the deepest part of our consciousness, we're striving to see patterns there. And the patterns that we dream up is this, this particular one. We have a choice. We can shift our point of view and all the patterns change into something else. Um, and so aligning levels of consciousness together to do that is um, this grand sort of consciousness experiment that we're up to here with these live streams. Um, let's talk about quantum 2.0, why we need to sharpen up our language. Quantum technology could benefit from us finding less spooky ways to describe the weird phenomena on which we're based. Um, our inability to find the right language to describe quantum phenomenon could be holding back the development of quantum technology. Now, I mentioned something about this last time that the words you choose to describe things uh, set up a prejudice in your mind. Um, so this sort of happens all the time. It's, um, you know, the the backbone of that idea is what I experienced when I first discovered this new brain frequency, epsilon, a frequency that is slower than the lowest delta that we were taught is what exists. We were taught that brain waves are in four categories and four categories only. That's it. Delta, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. And the lowest delta is 0 0.5 hertz, and the fastest beta is 30 until I could see it on EEG that there was something slower than delta. And so all of a sudden I'm going, wait a second, this can't be right. And the fact that my first place I went is this can't be right is because my brain had been solidified into a certain point of view by people who incorrectly told me that the universe is this way. Right? It sort of goes on and on. I... Um, our minds are conformed by forces of that have come to bear on our personalities as we've grown up, um, as we learn the ropes. And people who we believe know more than we do tell us what's so. But they're an error. 
And it turns out that um, most are historically in error. Sooner or later, we find out that it was an error after we lived a whole life and generations, according to these rules that we find out aren't so at all. Um, so changing our words to describe things or coming up with a new language to try to describe the interface between what we see in the quantum physics world and in the ancient descriptions from the past that describe the same thing, our descriptions of this macro world and the micro world need an overhaul. Um, we need to shift how we describe our own reality. Quantum physics tells us that nothing that is observed is unaffected by, by the observer, that statements from science holds, and this statement from science holds an enormous and powerful insight. It means that everyone sees a different truth because everyone is creating what they see. So there are certain standard principles that we're all agreeing on in the grand sense that there's, you know, planets and stars and nebula and galaxies and there's stuff in these worlds and there's cars and there's roads and there's jobs and there's people and there's interactions and we all agree on that but in the details of what they look like and how we experience it no two people see the same thing uh, because no two people's eyes are exactly the same and have the same color rendition or the same stereo field or because our ideas about things are, are the filter it all has to go through and our ideas have grown around what we've been taught is so. So what I, was, what I believe is so is very different from anybody else. It's a unique phenomenon in the universe. No two people see the, or experience the world the same way. Um, a rough guesstimate, yes, all of this hangs together. We all agree on basic principles, but at the core of it, we're all in our own worlds that we're generating. Where we touch that world and we make ripple patterns that affect everyone else and their view, all of these ripple patterns of my experience that's personal of the universe those ripples are going out and interacting with your ripples and creating the most complex ripple pattern that could possibly be of everyone's point of view, uh, all interacting together, forming complex standing waves that makes this appear to be what it is. Um, if I touch that pattern with a new idea, I send new ripple patterns out that changes the whole field eventually. Everyone gets touched by it. If we have multiple people touching at the same time where their brainwaves are aligned, we have a huge influence on this ripple pattern that forms reality itself. This is the concept behind brain entrainment of large groups of people together at the same moment shift the field. Time and space are modes by which we think and not conditions in which we live. Albert Einstein. We think all of this before a thought, so to speak. <laughs> it's not the rational thinking mind that makes it. But once we start to discover uh, quantum gravity and we started to discuss that, it was three episodes ago. Um, we stuck our foot in a gravity well that started to suck us in because where all this is going to end up having to go is uh, what is gravity and how does gravity affect um, the quantum field? Because right now, there's no math that explains it. And so a new new theories, and this is just now coming through, um, new theory seeks to unite gravity and quantum mechanics. It's, it's kind of always going on. 
scientists propose controversial theory that reconciles Einstein's gravity with quantum mechanics. Um, and uh, the upshot of it and why I like it um, is that so far they, they haven't been able to see something called quantum gravity. Gravity, as we experience it in the macro world, is a huge phenomenon, universal phenomenon that affects larger bodies. You and me falling towards the center of the Earth stopped by my chair. Uh, but the Earth itself is rotating around the Sun, and the Moon is rotating the Earth, all based on the same kind of gravity idea. What if quantum gravity held the secret that could reshape our understanding of reality and prove to be the theory of everything? Um, there were early attempts to look upon gravity uh, as um, having uh, something called a, a particle, a, gra a graviton. Uh, that came and went at one point, but it lingered. And that's what is evolving into this new idea of quantum pixelization. Uh, where it's back on the table with a new word. Uh, the idea that, um, I, I discussed this at one time before also, that this is a sort of a hyper-dimensional movie that we're seeing. And uh, even like right now, when you look at me on your computer screen, you know that it's not me you're seeing, that you're seeing moving pixels that are going on and off in three different color mixes so that I have color to my skin and things have color. That if you got yourself, you know, close enough to the screen and you looked really close and the closer you got and the closer you got and the closer you got, you would start to see that the screen has got these little colored pixels, you know, millions of them. And that really when I move my hand back and forth like this, it's actually the pixels are shutting off uh, at this side and turning on at this side. That makes it look like my hand is moving across the screen, but really it's just pixels going off here and turning on here and going off there and turning on here to make it look like it's doing this. So from that standpoint, in a hyperdimensional movie like this where the pixels are not on a flat screen, uh, but they're in a hyperdimensional screen, that the screen is 3D and 4D and 5D and 6D, and the pixels, no matter how close you get, are or how magnified uh, you use with an instrument to try to see those pixels, you can't penetrate through it because the pixel depth uh, is so dense and the pixels are so small that you can't see through the illusion of the screen that the pixels are Planck length small or perhaps smaller than the Planck length, that no matter how deep you go into the illusion, you can't see through it. Um, so scientists say the universe itself may be pixelated. Uh, and what is gravity itself made of? Made of pixels. That once you get to this level that the Pixelated space-time might explain a lot. Uh, if the fundamental constituents of space-time were to consist of a mixture of pixels, one could imagine that each universe had different proportions determined at its birth with consequent variations of properties, different kinds of pixels. The fundamental particles may thus be common to all. In other words, um, that's the one single thing that everything shares together, that reconciles um, all of the forces on one side of the wall with all the forces on the other side of the wall. And the grand forces of gravity that can't be reconciled with the quantum field has 
microgravity, mini gravity, quantum gravity, that it's just scalable. It's like octaves. It's like octaves of sound. Uh, if, if I take a recording of uh, dolphins, dolphin chirps, and I slow them down, after a few octaves of slowing down, it sounds like people singing. This is the concept of primordial sounds that are built into my soundtracks uh, that have such a profound effect on consciousness. This concept that if I take um, human speech pattern recordings of people speaking and I sp speed it up, it becomes chipmunks. And if I speed it up more, it becomes birds. And if I speed it up more, it becomes crickets. And speed it up more, it becomes dolphin chirps. That started me thinking, what happens if I take cricket sounds to slow them down? They sound like birds, and birds slow down sound like dolphins, and dolphins slow down sound like people. It's all the same stuff. It's, um, yeah. and then there's space sounds. So, you know, NASA approaches me with these space sound recordings of interactions of the ions, vibrating ions from the solar wind striking the ionosphere field of a of the planets of our solar system and causing those ions to resonate within the range of human hearing, 20 to 20,000 hertz. Uh, there's there's a, a sort of a vacuum in space that doesn't, that so there's no medium for that sound to transmit to your ear. But if you took a steel pole and stuck it on your forehead and put the pole down in that vibrating ion field, the pole would start to vibrate with sympathetic resonance and you'd be able to hear it. And that's how Voyager 1 and 2 recorded these space sounds that came back that sound like what? Crickets and birds and Tibetan bowls and choirs singing and dolphins and whales coming from flippant space. It's all this grand mix that is the same stuff at different size scales and different speeds, um, but it's all the same stuff. So if you look at the stuff of gravity in this macro world and you divide it by octaves into the micro world and the quantum world, you have quantum gravity obeying the same rules for a world that is smaller that sees it from their scale as the same as for me. I mean, I'm, I go outside I take my shoes and socks off, start walking in the grass. I get down on my hands and knees with a big magnifying glass and look closely. And I see between the braids of grass, a landscape, right? There's trails down there. There's boulders and there's little teeny tiny planty kind of things. And those little creatures going around that look like they're aliens from outer space. And from their standpoint, they're walking on a dusty trail with big boulders with uh, bl gray blades of grass that stick 300 feet into the sky. It's a forest of grass blades. It's an alien landscape under your feet. Your whole world is that way. I mean, your body has got millions of different creatures that live in your skin, right? There's, there's, a, <laughs> there's a, um, a species of mite, micro-sized mite that lives in your eyelashes. It's like craziness. It's whatever you think this is, you're wrong. It's so much weirder and so much more and so much more in depth. Um, that this concept of the pixelization of space-time itself and gravity itself means that once you realize that it's all a big hyperdimensional movie with pixels that make it up, that's your common factor. The fundamental constituents of space-time as pixels all of a sudden explains it all. And each of those pixels carries information, just like your TV screen, right? Each pixel is carrying information. And when, and when pixels align together and 
turn off, turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off, turn on, in order to make things appear like they're moving or rotating or whatever. Multiply that by 3D. Multiply the 3D by 10 dimensions um, and make the pixel so small you couldn't possibly see through it that it's tight and is organized and you can't see the pixels no matter how deeply you go and how magnified you get. Um, each of those pixels is making a decision of on or off or maybe <laughs> quantum idea, quantum pixels. Uh, you can start to get a touch if you stretch your mind enough around this concept of what's at the center of it all. What's at the center of this movie? Um, the quantum pixel. And it may be that the quantum pixel isn't the end of it. That even in itself, the quantum pixel might be made up of stuff that's smaller. The quantum pixel may not be a thing. It might be a black hole. It may be an entry into multiple universes of movies uh, and when you you know get down to it um, a space-time pixel is so small that if you were to enlarge things so that it becomes the size of a grain of sand then atoms would be as large as galaxies um, and smaller sooner or later you're back to these guys Sooner or later, when you get to the, to the smallest of the smallest of the small and realize that it, it's all pixels and the pixels are a movie and it's a hyper-dimensional movie in all time scales and all size scales, in all dimensions, in all parallel universes all happening at once, an infinite number of stories being lived out and told, my story, your story, um, that underlying it is what the ancient texts in the Vedas had talked about. The concept of the Godhead having a dream, having a dream in an infinite number of dimensions and parallel universes, dreams within dreams within dreams, as only a mind of a God could do that it's beyond comprehension of a normal neuron processing brain that's attempting to understand it. That brain, as magnificent as our quantum brain is, can never quite open wide enough to grab the real essence of this concept. It's, it can only stretch itself so wide. And when it does so, when it can actually stretch itself to its max to try to grab this idea, it blows open completely and you break through into the present moment, experiencing it in all of its glory. The mind can't go there. The mind has to be left behind. It has to be shoved off like a like a chrysalis, like a butterfly coming out of a chrysalis. The mind has to blow open and the, the chrysalis has to fall away. And uh, the real essence of my consciousness arrives in the center of all of it and then can encompass it because who's doing the dreaming is my root self of all selves that in an infinite universe of, quote, godhood, there is nothing other than that. Therefore, that's me and that's you and that's everything. That the concept that God is something else, something, some other place, is an uh, infantile idea. It's a trap of my ordinary mind that has to be released that when I arrive in the center of my true self, this is what I find. 
access to the most ancient of the ancients, who has dreamed it all up and has all the answers and all the formulas and all the questions. There's no question that can be asked that doesn't autom automatically have the answer. There's no further place to go. I've finally arrived at my place of my home, my place. It's like in the ancient texts of the Vedas where Krishna reveals his universal form to Arjuna and, our, and it's an infinite number of faces and eyes and noses and mouths and hands and bodies in every kind of configuration you could ever imagine, including beyond human. It's animals, it's reptiles, it's bugs, it's creatures, it's bacteria, it's every kind of force that consciousness could possibly populate and create, stretching to infinity in all directions, in all possible times and size scales. Um, and when Arjuna sees this, he becomes weak in the knees and falls down, and his whole body is shaking, and he's in a sweat, and his mind and his heart are exploding trying to comprehend. His mind can't possibly comprehend what he's seeing. And his emotions can't possibly comprehend how they're supposed to react. So it's a combination of, I don't know whether I should be in a state of awe or fear or love or, it's all of those once again falling away like a chrysalis and a new butterfly of my heart comes forth with a new emotion I've never felt before. That's indescribable. That my mind falls away and I have a new level of understanding I've never had before, before a thought. Um, at the root of all of us is the desire for this, for this experience. It what is what drives us in religion. It's what drives us into meditation. It what drives us into experimentation with uh, sacred psychedelic medications. It's it's what drives all of humanity since the beginning of time uh, to find the answer to the ultimate sort of question. A dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. That's what these life streams are trying to get to, is to align ourselves together and create a new reality. Um, a reality out of an, a sort of an infinite number of possibilities of what reality could be, we have the power to choose, the power to choose. So with that being said, um, we have our, put on your phone on phones. <laughs> and let's go for a little trip together center yourself on that concept of opening every door of yourself to the nub of what uh, the core of reality really is. See if you can allow the soundtrack to take this part of your mind away and allow yourself to have a glimpse of what that might be. Here we go.
Mm. Well, <sighs> thank you all. It's my joy and pleasure to be here with you. Um, as crazy as these talks, again, um, we have a really nice community. Um, we're attempting to um, broaden that community uh, because there's quite a discussion that happens here afterwards. And we'd like to create a format where that can kind of go all the time if you would like. Um, we already have that community set up with the community of practitioners that we train and certify to do the sound work biotuning stuff and they're all over the world and we talk to each other all the time and <clears throat> answer questions and help and help out um, um while i'm on that note um just know that um becoming a practitioner of biotuning and entering into a scientific approach of using sound for healing can change your life. You can do that as a living. Uh, so if that's an interest to you, um, give Shay a call or Austin or contact us through the website. Um, that being said, I'm going to keep this live stream up for a, a while longer. Um, it's been my pleasure and joy to be here and I will see you all next week. Thank you all for being here.
track is playing right now? Is this one of your unreleased tracks? Uh, Epsilon. Oh, this is Epsilon? I think it might be us. I think this is just a straight soundtrack. It hasn't been doctored. <laughs> 